what we mean by uh, ecosystem services and relating to uh, biodiversity. Now that really gets us to the question of uh, what would be the scope and dimensions of what we are talking about within FAO also uh, in this uh, sort of cross-cutting theme. And that really we should start from livestock. Uh, so I would like to uh, present uh, Ms. Irani Hoffman of uh, AGA Division together with Mr. Martin Sunevelt of uh, the NRL Division to make this a joint presentation. Thank you, Ren and Barbara. So we are going to talk about the role of livestock as providers of ecosystem services and also, also how we can incentivize producers to deliver those. And I will start with the presentation of how does FRO's policy cycle usually work. So usually we get a policy request by one of our governing bodies and they ask us to provide evidence or do assessments or give them some basis for discussion and a decision which they then do in a policy response. So one governing body gives us a mandate and then we support countries in the implementation of whatever that was, a guideline, a regulation, a voluntary code or whatever. In the case we are talking about, as Barbara mentioned already, the policy request came from the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture and that asked us to identify the nature of ecosystem services provided by livestock species and breeds and also pay attention to small-scale livestock keepers and pastoralists. And as was already mentioned, it also requested FAO to do two global assessments, the one on the state of the world's biodiversity for food and agriculture and the second state of the world on animal genetic resources. But there was a parallel movement coming out of the Committee for Food Security where the civil society mechanism requested FAO to work more on pastoralism and also the governance questions related to land tenure are coming up very strongly. So when we responded to the request of the Commission, uh, there were a few methodological issues. For example, how do you address this perspective of livestock sector supply on the general concept of ecosystem services? And also there are not a, lo a lot of data. So we used a mix of methods, for example, uh, GIS, looking at spatial distribution, land cover classes, climate zones, then map production systems, and on this map, at least a probability of breed, certain breeds occurring. We did a global survey on ecosystem services in grazing systems because of uh, the vast land area and the link to pastoralists and then we used the country responses that came from the two state of the world report. And this is just the, an overview that links to what Barbara has said. If we look at terrestrial land cover then uh, tree covered areas which are also used by livestock as grazing are about the double area of what is used globally as cropland and livestock also contributes to crop production in very many ways. But the biggest land area globally is on grasslands, rangelands, shrubs, savannas and so on. And we should not forget that this provides the major uh, food base for livestock production, for example, in milk. When we mapped the breeds, we found that um, quite a substantial number of breeds, particularly in sheep, more than 50%, where are probably locally adapted breeds that can really live in these harsh and marginal uh, rangeland systems. From the uh, grazing um, ecosystem services study, we found that habitat provisioning is one of the major supporting services mentioned, followed by nutrient cycling and the support to primary productivity. In regulating service, there is a whole range of regulating services where livestock contributes, for example, erosion control and bush encroachment in, in uh, steep mountain areas or fire prone areas, weed control, seed dispersal um, across landscapes, and then, as already mentioned, water and climate regulation. Cultural services are very strong. That was confirmed by the indigenous people and pastoralists this week. And there is a one 
part of the pie that looks at landscape values, the traditional landscapes created by livestock that come to recreation, and then the cultural ones. So the Commission responded and gave a whole range of requests to FAO and to the countries to implement, and it asked us particularly to work, for example, on assessment methods for valorization of ecosystem service to develop results-based incentive systems. That opens a, a vast area of collaboration with the main area of work and also along the rangeland and pastoralist axis where lots of units in FAO are already collaborating and with link to governance, then on valorization and on incentives. And I just took a few figures from the global assessments where you can see that the total economic value of grasslands is double that of woodlands. And um, a large part of this comes from provisioning services, but half is made up of the other ecosystem services. And only part of this is paid for, and that's why Martin is now looking into incentives. Thank you, Irene. Good morning. How can we make sure that the different benefits from livestock or other agricultural systems are valued? A major problem of ecosystem services is the fact that farmers face various adoption barriers. Let's take the example of silvopastoral systems. Erosion reduction is just one possible benefit of this improved grazing practice. However, establishment costs can be high while capital availability in rural areas is often low or the return to the investment may be delayed for several years. Therefore, farmers need incentive to overcome these kind of adoption barriers. Concretely, incentives may range from more regulatory measures such as standards to more vol voluntary ones like payment for ecosystem services or labeling and certification. Improved access to information, knowledge and markets are other important incentives. Designing incentive mechanisms involves various aspects. Who benefits from the service? How can service providers be linked with the beneficiaries? And what kind of models are used to remunerate those farmers who actually provide ecosystem services? If we take the example of erosion reduction, the value of this service is embodied in the reduced cost for water treatment due to less sediment. Companies or communities profit from reduced cost or increased quality of the water. They are willing to pay for erosion control further up the river. Effective incentive mechanisms require emancipated partners and a strong policy framework, ensuring tenor and user rights, as well as law enforcement. That's why I believe we need to continue exploring the potential for incentives for ecosystem services highlighting both success factors but also implementation bottlenecks and this allows us to design efficient mechanisms which are supporting the transition to more sustainable agricultural systems overall. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Irani and Martin, for that uh, joint presentation. Good morning. I am Pablo Manzano. I'm coordinating the Pastoralist Knowledge Hub. And uh, I wanted to make a comment regarding the ecosystem services provided by livestock. As uh, livestock cover huge expanses of land, uh, in fact, we, we could think of the extensive uh, livestock practices that actually cover um, most grasslands as well as other rangelands such as some forests, some wetlands. Um, and also we should think on the uh, mobile livelihoods that take place in these, in these areas that are usually pretty difficult to capture by the interventions that, that we design, but that nevertheless due to this mobility keep these lands in equilibrium and manage to to get uh, a profit on these lands that otherwise are not exploitable by, by other livelihoods. I think the, this debate on ecosystem services provides a link for, uh, uh, for the environmental issues with the agricultural production aspects as well as with uh, very important but very uh, forgotten sometimes social aspects. 
Um, this is actually what we are trying to achieve with the with the pastoralist knowledge hub that has been set up to to make these links. But um, I was wondering if uh, if it's time to reflect on uh, on maybe um, bringing all stakeholders together, both inside FAO and also uh, creating a voice from FAO into into the outside. To, to talk about these aspects and to get a, a clearer picture on these, uh, on these links in the livestock extensive production. Thank you. My name is John Fernandez de la Rinoa. I'm the advocacy officer for indigenous peoples and gender in OPCA. Congratulations for the, for the initiative and for being all together in the podium. Uh, it is extremely important. Two days ago, we just concluded an important meeting with indigenous peoples leaders from the seven regions identified by the indigenous peoples. And this came up very strongly, actually, and it was captured during the closure that our director general did at that meeting when he requested assistance from uh, indigenous uh, leaders to help us in working in a more integrated way that will consider not necessarily or not only sustainable agriculture, but sustainable food systems based on indigenous food systems, on traditional knowledge, and why uh, a sustainable food system instead of sustainable agriculture? Because it will encompass much more than only agriculture. It will encompass also gathering. It will encompass uh, a, a hunting. And uh, in, in, in many ways, connects with the comment that our colleagues from uh, Irani office just made. No? Thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to respond to, to the livestock-related uh, questions and also the land use planning-related questions because as regards livestock and, and the vast areas, they go hand in hand. Um, and that also relates to the wildlife. Yes, there is a strong link between wildlife and livestock and we found also in our survey that livestock graze in many nature conservation areas and in many cases nature conservation in grassland depends on livestock presence so this is a, a co-evolution but that needs to be very carefully managed there are wildlife livestock conflicts that that occur and land competition is only one, but uh, lions and wolves eating the livestock are another one, and disease transmission is another one that need to be managed and where evidence has to be there to establish the costs and benefits for the different stakeholders so that you can start a discussion on who is paying and who gets rewarded for what. And that also brings us to the, to the participatory land use planning. At the moment, AGP and NRL and various units, also forestry, we are all working together to, to see how technologies, participatory tools, GIS, apps, modern technologies can be put together to see how we can reach the pastoralists to enable people to do land restoration, to do better management. And if what Sally says, we can also collect much more, much better local level data to really provide the evidence that would really bring us a big step forward also in these questions about economic valuation. As regards root, yes, I fully agree. But um, that's again a question of evidence. There is much less data and evidence on differences of animal products uh, in, in nutritious value than in plants. And I think that is an area of, of research that we as FAO cannot really do, but we have to engage um, others to do it. And related to livestock food systems, it's not only about the quantity of consumption, it's the quality of consumption, and we may have to reconsider the way we do consume livestock products.